All right. Well, welcome to week four. Uh, we're almost to the halfway point, uh, at least as far as the, the chapters go. We only have six more to go, so uh, we're making pretty good progress. Um, for, uh, of course, for tonight we're going to be covering uh, chapter five, which deals with intellectual property and reputation risk. And uh, I know some people kind of go, oh my gosh, this is such a boring topic, but the real, I, in many ways, especially with contracts, this is probably one of the biggest areas, especially for those, um, if you're a corporate organiz office organization where you're hiring people to do certain type of work or to create software or uh, develop manuals or anything like that, at least on the intellectual property side, this is key because one of the biggest disputes is who owns what was created. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, obviously, for university requirements, uh, um, for those that work for university or for UC, um, a couple years ago, uh, all employees were required to sign a new patent agreement that basically says anything that we create in the course and scope of our employment is owned by the university. Um, it kind of spells out, unless we say what those things we created beforehand are part of that, or if there, unless there's agreements in place. Um, and so most universities have a technology transfer uh, department, which is basically the idea of intellectual property. And uh, again, who owns it and who gets the royalties based upon it, who can license it uh, on there. And then the second part, the little shorter uh, part, is going to be talking a little more about reputation risk um, and uh, how you can uh, prevent or manage that from a risk management perspective. Um, so as we go through the, our objectives uh, for reading this, and again, if you go read through the summary and, and how this went, you know, there's a couple of things that are going to be really focused on. And the areas, obviously, uh, the major focus, uh, more than anything, is going to be on uh, the, the four different types of intellectual property. Um, so first, obviously, the nature and types of intellectual property. We're going to talk about the copyright risks and how we do to control those, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. And as we go through, one of the things that's probably uh, the, the key thing is to recognize, you know, all of them have notice requirements or all of them have, you know, uh, restrictive covenants or, or those different areas. What are the similarities between those? Because that's typically where the question is going to come of which one of these has the same type of approach on it. Um, and then a little bit about valuing intellectual property. How do you say what it's worth? And then uh, the last part we'll be talking about uh, reputation risk and, and how um, you know, the key sources of risk, of reputation risk, and, and how you can treat it as an asset and how you manage it uh, to really prevent something bad um, from happening to, to your reputation. <clears throat> so as we go through, um, as far as the introduction, you know, first, you know, let's define what intellectual property is, and essentially it's the product of human intelligence that has an economic value. Um, and, and put it other ways, it's you know, ideas and information from a, just a very basic standpoint. If that's what we're talking about is ideas and information. And that economic value comes from the right uh, of the owner to exclude others from using it. So, um, or exclude, uh, exclude others from using it or charging others to use it uh, is another way to think about it. So intellectual property ranges from fiction, music, design, art, product names, inventions, processes, formulas, and software programs. Um, and, and really, as it kind of indicates, most organizations really have no idea of really, you know, what their inventory of intellectual property is um, and who really owns it. And, and uh, you know, and, and part of that is even when you have someone that works for an organization and they leave, well, if there's no agreements in place, who really owns it? Can they use it? Um, and, and, I, and when we talk more about this and we go into patents, one of the things that, that's happening now for those that listen to NPR, there's uh, actually some very good discussions on uh, people that are stealing you know, or, or buying patents just for the purpose of suing people for patent infringement. And that's how they're making their money, is uh, requiring people uh, to license certain things. And in many cases, the, uh, they're just ideas um, that someone patented, and now supposedly people have to pay for those. Uh, then when we talk about infringement, is the unauthorized use of an individual's intellectual property. Um, and the idea is being able to recognize intellectual property rights of another to avoid infringement can be the most cost-effective risk control measure possible. Uh, and you always have lawsuits claiming infringement uh, are also difficult to defend. Um, so the idea is when someone uses, um, you know, in a presentation, you know, or, um, you know, to be able to use material. And, and then we're talking about fair use doctrine. And, and so when you do, usually with an education, you know, there's a pretty good fair use doctrine of how you use things, but if you don't give credit 
to the source, those type of things, that's where we, you get into trouble or if you claim it your own or if you're making, um, you know, money off of that. So um, if you think this is where this comes into play is if you have a, um, you know, with music, that's probably the most popular one now. Um, if you, uh, uh, skate, skating rink, you play music. Well, technically you're supposed to pay royalties based upon that music because if, it, if you, if you had people skate, would people still skate if you didn't have the music? Well, probably not. So there's a value that's placed upon the music that you're playing for the public. There was uh, the whole story recently that um, the happy birthday um, was in the news. What a couple, you know, and the courts finally decided that, you know, something that, that whole thing, that copyrights ran out. Um, that, you know, you can't claim license and say that, you know, anymore when people sing happy birthday on TV, that supposedly you're supposed to pay the family or the estate. Uh, how much whatever money that they're claiming uh, for that. Um, and so within the U.S., um, there's, you know, there, there's, when we talk about a body of law, there's, there's, we have statutes, regulations, and, and as well as case law that really helps determine what is intellectual property, who owns it. Um, and that body of law gives uh, IP, so when I start, you know, I got tired of typing intellectual property, so most people refer to it as IP. Uh, so when um, IP owners uh, gives right to enforce their rights in, uh, to court, in courts, and typically it's going to be a civil lawsuit. They're going to take someone to court, and the, you know, really they're trying to make money off of it. But we're seeing in some cases now um, where if you, obviously everyone skips ahead in the movies where it talks about, hey, if you re-record or use this film or you know, try to do that, you could be held. That's a criminal copyright violation. And we're seeing, you typically see more of the criminal charges really with media, you know, and, and it's, it's because of the big dollar, you know, uh, corporations that are really going to go after to try to stop that trend. Um, but typically on most smaller things, you're going to see more of a civil lawsuit uh, in, in that regard. Yeah, Herb? They determine if Napster was an infringement. Remember the whole Napster issue? So, Napster? Yeah, and if I, so the question is regarding Napster, and, and you know, almost, that's probably almost 10 years ago now, I guess. Um, and so, if you know Napster, what would happen with that is you saw everyone change their business model uh, of how they did that because Napster was more of a file sharing where people were were basically uploading and downloading um, material that maybe they bought at some point, but then other people were now downloading it, and, and so there's no royalties provided to the. Um, in this case, I think it was the uh, recording industry is the one that was pursuing it. And so what you see now, and that's really, uh, and you talk about an opportunity uh, where Apple, you know, the idea is will people pay for it? Uh, well, they would. And so Apple, I mean, if you think about the iStore and all that, you know, you know the iTunes uh, store, that, I, you can say that was probably an opportunity where they saw the environment and they said, wow, you know, um, if you can create an environment to where people will be willing and not pay you know, because also albums at that point, you know, you're, you're getting to $14 for a CD where people, you know, but now it also changed the industry because people are now willing to just buy one song, whereas you didn't have to buy the full thing. And so it made it a little bit, it made it more affordable. So, um, you know, from a risk management or risk optimization, you know, you can kind of look at how the things change. And now even you have Pandora, um, you can get it for free, but in return, so Pandora is paying to play that music but they're also having the commercials on there that interrupt, so that's how they're making the revenue. Right. And so things, so the people have to figure out what their business model is of how they're going to be able to recoup those dollars for that. Um, and then the issue now we have is, you know, as we come, become more global, you know, risk managers must understand IP prote protections throughout the world. So it's one thing to understand what we have um, in, in the U.S., but, um, you know, typically it's indicated there's reciprocal rights of protection depending on what country, but for the most part, most have signed agreements that, um, you know, if someone's making bootleg copies of something in one country or um, purses or, you know, those type of things, you know, MLB, you know, uh, licensed material or trying to recreate it, that, um, that there's going to be some uh, reciprocity to be able to go after those uh, bad actors. Um, the one thing that they note in the book, uh, whether this is necessarily important from a testing standpoint, but Thailand and Malaysia are, signator, uh, are not signatories. I mistyped that. I'll make sure I correct it. So are not signatories of the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So that's a big, so <laughs> I'll make sure I correct that on the slides, but make sure that uh, for those who are listening, um, you know, after the fact that Thailand and Malaysia are not signatories. So um, 
my mistake on omitting that. And so if you think about, you know, more of the, um, you know, um, Asian, you know, Eastern Asian areas, or um, you know, that's that um, that's where we probably see more of the bootlegging. And so I think that's you know one of those issues that if something's created there, we have no reciprocity. Louis Vuitton, yeah. Louis, Louis Vuitton, yeah. Louis Vuitton. Yeah, yeah, Louis, Louis, yeah, that's correct. Or even the, and, you know, Apple got, um, and and actually one of the things that um, you know, I think is important too that when people recreate an item, and this was actually a story that was done, um, and I was going to send, I'll send this out, and it had to do with um, that some companies are making, um, uh, you know, the Apple, the charging, whatever, the cube, whatever you want to call it, so that you the plug-in, the adapter. Um, and so you have a lot of knockoff adapters because Apple charges 20 bucks, and a lot of people give them grief for, why do you charge $20 for something so basic, and these other ones are being sold for five? Well. The problem is a lot of these things aren't um, aren't really certified, and what they're finding is they're blowing up, having fires or electrical shorts, or or um, maybe I don't know if it's worse is that um, you know makes your iPhone or iPod die because of, uh, the circuitry is not right, and so because of that, because of the number of those that are out there, um, uh, um, Apple's now somewhat taking advantage of the situation, you know, they're, and they're still making money off of it. Is that they're offering a replacement? Anyone that comes in and brings uh, one of the, you know, not a, an official Apple uh, adapter that they can, they'll, they'll sell them a new one, a real one for $5 or something like that, um, not be 10 But the idea is, is that, um, you know, they're trying to say, look, what, that someone can charge them for a bad product that someone tried to duplicate because of what they've done. And so they're concerned that someone might be able to sue them. And I'll, I'll send the article because it explains it much better than what I am. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, which there probably will be some type of uh, question that talks about, you know, which one of these uh, has to deal with uh, copyright laws at an international level. And so uh, the Berne Convention uh, governs copyrights in most countries, and uh, for some reason I remember that there'll be something along those lines. Uh, as well as the Paris Convention was the first major international treaty designed to help people in one country obtain protection in another. So the whole idea of intellectual property, um, you know, is it's been around and it's been discussed, but I think it's even more prevalent really in probably the last 10 years where we see just the whole um, issue of, of, you know, copyright and patent infringement and those type of things going on. So the four types of intellectual property protection um, that we're going to be uh, discussing um, are, um, you know, the first one I thought I'd put on there is going to be the uh, copyright. Um, and, you know, we're going to go through the, the four, and again, since there's a list that's four, you know, these are the four you want to make sure you know of intellectual property. So copyright is a legal right granted by the government to an individual or company for a period of years to exclusively own and control an original written document, piece of music, software, other form of expression. Um, and typically protect, uh, copyright laws protect the literal form that expressive work takes, not the ideas and underlying concepts of expressive work and can last up for a century or more. And so that was the issue with the birthday song. Happy birthday was, you know, I think it was it had a 75 year patent or something like that. Um, or copyright, excuse me. Then we have trademark, which is a legal right granted by the government to, to a company to exclusively own and control a distinctive design or set of words that legally identifies a product or service as belonging to that company. Uh, the intent is to create a distinction of the products or services that the organization provides in the minds of its customers. Uh, and this, that, and a trademark lasts indefinitely. That can that would be owned. Now, as we go through these, you'll notice that you know the, the legal right granted by the government. We <laughs> talked about legal right. The third legal right granted by the government is a patent, um, and get granted by the government to an inventor or applicant for a limited period of time to exclusively own and control a new, useful, and non-obvious invention, which is I think is key, non-obvious invention. Uh, there are three types of patents: utility. Does, utility, design, and plant, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. And, and uh, the patent office, um, you know, you have to apply at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The last one is a trade secret, and this is the one that's not a government-granted um, type of right, and that's where the distinction is between the four that we just mentioned. Um, and a trade secret is a practice, method, process, design, or other information used confidentially by an organization to maintain a competitive advantage. Okay, well, trade secret. 
okay, what's the recipe for the, you know, Coke, Coca-Cola, or Pepsi, or KFC, or what's Bush's beans with the dog, right? I mean, those are the types of things. It's, those are considered to be trade secrets of how they make those products. Um, and protection applies if the information was improperly disclosed to or acquired by a competitor, and if the owner took reasonable precautions to keep it secret. And that can also last indefinitely. So the idea is as long as you protect your trade secrets, that you just don't have stuff out there all over the place where people could figure it out, but you, you treat it as a trade secret. If someone does end up stealing it or, you know, through means, um, was it, uh, um, you know, I guess, corporate espionage or whatever, you could then recover penalties based upon that and, and recover dollars. But at the same time, even with the recovery dollars, you may end up, you know, once that trade secret gets out, you still, I mean, the, the value of that could be so great. Uh, that it really destroys a company or organization. What's an example of a non-obvious uh, invention? So a non okay, the difference of a non-obvious when we talk about a patent. Um, so uh, a pencil. Um, I mean, so, so you 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 make a you 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 make a new eraser for a pencil or something. It's just something that's just so basic. I mean, the, the idea is that well. It's kind of out there. I mean, it's not, it's not unique, I guess. A, a suggestion, looking at can openers, there was the traditional design, okay. and then they came up with the kind that slices it off cleanly around mm -hmm. the product. And it's so different okay. that even though can openers already existed, they got a patent on the new method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, so I guess I went the other way. So I was talking about obvious, but yeah, non-obvious is, yeah, it's just something that it's, it's, it's different enough um, that it's not the same thing, basically. Um, in there. Um, so one of the things that I recommend on this, is this is one of those areas that I would kind of focus on, is how are um, these things aligned? So a trade secret and copyright. So you can start with a trade secret, which then may turn into a copyright. And that's the idea of what this, what this slide's really trying to show, is that um, how are these things aligned and where's the cooperation between? So uh, same thing with a trade secret. You might have a trade secret, which is going to be turned into a patent. Or, you know, copyright law protects the expression of an idea, but not the idea itself. So, you know, the copyright might protect the written material describing the, the, uh, the idea, but then you need a patent that protects, you know, the idea, so not just the expression. So that's where you want to, so the, most likely, if I remember correctly from, you know, years of doing this, there's typically some type of question that kind of says, of these, which things are aligned, or how, what's the relationship between these, or which one of these describes a relationship and it'll describe that this is an expression and then you'll have to figure out, okay, it's copyright and patent and you're gonna have you're gonna have options of trade secret and patent or you know, all those type of choices to select from. So that's typically um, there's typically a question like that. So again just you want to know the difference between those. So we talk about um, from a copyright, what you know what does that actually mean and how do we actually create a copyright? Um, well up until I guess what, nineteen seventy eight when we talk about some of these things, um, uh, or before, but copyrights are automatically applied to all types of original expression, where the expression is authored in the form of words, musical notes, sculpture, video, or line source of, of computer code. And you don't have to register it. You get extra protection by registering a copyright. But essentially, once I put something up on the web, and it's unique, it's a unique idea or expression, I, I can, if I want to, I can put a little C on the bottom and say, this is copyrighted now. And anyone that uses this, uh, there. Even without putting a copyright, it technically is copyright. <coughs> so anything that's on the web that people cut and paste or those type of things and want to claim their own, um, you know, they can say it's copyright. Now there's some, you know, again, that the criteria for copyright is, again, the work must be original. Um, and these are the key components of, of a copyright of what makes it a copyright. The work must be fixed in a tangible medium of expression that's permanently recorded. Okay. So, Technically, you can say, well, the web changes. Well, no, it's still a permanent medium. The web itself is up there. It's going on. Um, you know, books are tangible medium. Records, CDs. Um, you know, and then that's where you also have is, well, music is now not is it really tangible anymore. It's a, it's a file. Well, but it's on a medium, which is uh, on, uh, up on a site. But the work is original, so that's the other criteria. The work must also have some degree of creativity. Uh, but there's no set rules exist about what constitutes enough creativity. Now, this is where, um, you know, as a safety person that does training, 
when you say when you do a training class is what you create you, you create a training manual um, and people a lot of times people want to copyright oh I created this training manual or I created this policy I would argue that that's not creative <laughs> it's 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 following a law following a regulation and you're writing policies or procedures or training material that follows um, some of that so it's you know some people you know that, that but again that's why there's no set rule of what constitutes you know a, a, enough creativity but you know is there enough uniqueness okay you, you drew some pictures that were specialized or you um, you imputed some different knowledge uh, that's real specific to an area but a lot of times what I see is people put a copyright on training material and it's the same stuff that's almost regurgitated right from you know the regulations uh, that are up there and so um, I'm not sure really how much that that really, uh, you know, uh, really has copyright protection, and from that standpoint, uh, copyrights are generally owned by the author who created the work, except in the following cases. And, and again, this is I think important to know: when the work was created in the course of the author's employment, it's a work for hire, uh, and, and so then the copyright is owned by the employer. And and that's pretty much it. that's stand. I mean, that is standard if you're working for an employer. Um, then you know you're doing it during work hours. It's kind of some specific what we call in the course and scope of employment. And, and also, I would say, when you're using equipment, the employer's equipment, you're using all those things. That really becomes, hey, the, the employer truly does own that. Now, if you're doing it at home, you're writing a book on your own. You're not using, you know, you don't want to use the, the laptop that the uh, company provides you and those type of things then yes, you can claim that. But at the same time, if you're going to do that, you'd also want to put some type of, uh, as a person, let's say, writing this, um, have an agreement with the company saying, look, I'm doing this, let them know I'm doing this, and, or at least set some dates or have some type of protection or have an attorney you know, say that you're doing this, especially if it's in the same type of, the, the concern is if it's in the same business as what your company does. So if you're uh, a programmer, you work, you know, you work for, uh, you know, a, you know, Xbox or whatever you're doing, and then you're making your own programs at home. Then there can be some some dispute there. Mm -hmm. So the other uh, other issue is when the work was created on commission, um, and so the copyright is then owned by the commissioning party. And so if, if contracts, and this is where it's, this is why, which I get excited about this stuff, but contracts are so key. If contracts are silent to who owns it. By commissioning the work, whoever commissioned the work now owns the work of that consultant. Um, this is also an issue that if I say I want, I want you to build an application that does X, Y, Z, I own that application. Um, and so they go, well, I'm going to, you know, they take, they built you, uh, they built it for you, and then they start reselling it to others. That's you could go after for copyright infringement, saying no, we well, no, we own the license to it. We didn't give you the right to resell uh, in doing that. And so, um, you know, having been a former consultant, that's one of the issues I know uh, that the company I worked for always looked at was okay. Or if nothing else is, usually you're, you're not going to be able to say that we still own the rights to material. No, no, no uh, you know, employer, you know, hiring person is going to say, yeah, you, you will pay you to develop it, and you get full ownership. But you might get joint ownership of, of something like that, or you get free use of perpetual license of it uh, to be able to use for, for other clients. Uh, or what typically can be done is maybe there um, you can work out a deal where you're jointly paying for it, and then again there's joint ownership with it, and then one party gets free license for the rest of their life and updates and things like that. And then the other time when it's not owned by the person is when the author sells the copyright or ownership is transferred to the buyer. So in cases where um, what could happen is that I, I'm a consultant and uh, I develop an application or program or write a, you know, uh, certain, do some work for a, a company or organization, and then, I, you know, because the contract wasn't, I didn't do a good job on my contract, I could say, you know something, I'll pay you back so that I can have a license or copyright. I want to buy the copyright to be able to use this for other purposes. And again, it depends on the organization whether they'll do that. Um, the first two exemptions, you know, I think that as you saw in there, are considered work for hire exemptions. So whether that you're as an employee or as a consultant, both are considered work for hire exemptions to the copyright law. As far as the duration, uh, it really depends uh, on when the work was originally created. So. Um, 
basically 1978 is kind of the key year uh, of whether, um, depending on you know how it's how it goes. So works created on or after January 1st, 1978, are automatically protected for the author's life plus an additional 70 years. So basically, so um, whenever whenever I create this until I die, then plus 70 is what the rule of thumb is on copyright. So the estate essentially for the next 70 years owns the copyright. Is it transferable, or does that happen automatically? Um, well, it would most likely it would. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure on that one. I, I would I would presume it would probably go to um, who, the estate of whoever owned it, and then it would go into probate. So, if I was, if you're the, you know, however the the will said or something like that, that might be part of it. I think of some of the music that's out there now. You know how, um, like old blues and things like that. You see they're, they're you know, yep. reissuing them. So, who gets the profit and who makes the decision? Well, and if you think about one of the things that happen is. Um, so you have uh, what, who bought the Beatles? Uh, Michael, Jackson. Michael Jackson. That's right. He bought the whole whatever catalog of Beatles music. So at that point, then he makes all the money, the revenue off the replaying of that. Um, and now with his estate, it's probably gone to his, his children. That that whole catalog. So that copyright is now transferred. And so that's how you know essentially kind of buying that ownership uh, in there. Um, works originally created before the uh, January first, seventy eight. Uh, but not published or registered by that date or given federal copyright protection. Uh, the duration of the copyright for these works is typically the same as for works created after, um, but life plus 70 years. But in that case, um, again, but not published or registered by the date. Prior to that, you typically had to register um, most of your uh, copyrights. Uh, works, and this is all more of the detail. Um, and that, this is probably not as important. Um, you know, as far as because it goes through a lot of detail on even in the book, it kind of talks about you know Copyright Act of 1976, extended the renewal term from 28 to 47 years, um, things like that. Probably the one that you may want to look at is it's more whether there might be questions more the Public Law 105-298, um, which basically was the most recent change and extended uh, you know the renewal uh, terms of copyrights by additional 20 years. So a total term protection of 75, or excuse me, 95 years now, is uh, what copyrights can go for. So it's a pretty significant amount of time. So when we talk about, so we know what copyrights are, we know what some of the protections, when, and, and part of this is identifying when there's a copyright infringement. And this is one of the big issues that um, maybe as an employer you have copyright issues uh, that you want to protect, but there's also the issue of, you know, we don't want our employees violating copyright laws for us to get sued. So that's kind of, you know, you got to look at it from both sides of this. Um, and, and this was always, I would say, probably a bigger issue many times uh, in libraries or if you go now to a, um, well, uh, a Rite Aid or a CVS where you want to duplicate pictures, you had a professional photographer and it says you cannot duplicate with that unless you have permission. And uh, some, you know, they'll be very vigilant on, nope, can't do it. And that's part, again, that whole copyright. So uh, that's why they're doing it, because if they allow that medium to be copied, they can then be sued for allowing or not having, trying to do their due diligence uh, in protecting copyright, because they, they're actually giving a means to do it. So when we talk about, and we're going to be going through each one of these uh, loss exposures, and it's going to be the same format for basically each of these different types of intellectual property. And the, what I would pr try to do is when you um, look at these is, You'll see notice, registration, restrictive covenants. Some of these things are going to be similar for each one. And that's what you want to, you know, if you maybe do a matrix or something, identify. Because there will probably be a question saying, which, which of these things have the, um, all have the notice requirement? Or which of these things are, have the most similarities or something like that? So what we're going to be talking about is notice, uh, issue, registration, restrictive covenants, responses to an anticipated defense, as well as licensing agreements. And copyright probably has the most... Um, you know, uh, measures uh, for protection. So when we talk about notice, uh, what we're basically talking about is to, um, to control copyright infringement exposures, many owners place a copyright notice on their published work. And so um, it's, you know, one thing to have it up there, it's another thing, but when you put the little C, um, the little C symbol, the copyright symbol that we're all so used to seeing, that essentially is you've now provided notice that this is copyrighted or you deem this to be copyrighted and you're followed by the year in which the work was published and the name of the copyright owner. Um, so for instance on all UC websites, no matter what, well, UCLA, it says copyright UC Regents 
2013. So, um, so for the UC system, even though works may be created at a specific site, Berkeley, all those type of things, because of the way the copyright with our, our policies are, everything is owned by the UC Regents. So all the profits of royalties and lessers of agreements technically are owned by the Regents based upon that. Um, once the notice is placed on a published work, any party that copies the work without permission cannot claim lack of knowledge for the copyright. So the whole idea is just by putting that little C on there, you've provided notice to anyone else that this is copyright. So if you see that and you say, no, this was put out, we've, I've got this notice here, this, and now you're using it, you, have a, you now have a defense or you can go after that person that's now infringed on the copyright. It's a little more difficult if you don't put the copyright notice on there. Um, and so now there's an expectation um, that there's a copyright by those that put that on there. Um, and then website postings are copyrighted once published. So once it's out there, if there's a date stamp, those type of things. Um, and one of the things it talks about in the book now, there's like digital watermarking, uh, provides notice for work published on the internet by embedding information about the copyright owner onto the organization's video, audio, graphic files. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of files that, you know, the pictures, like the, the uh, picture you might want to use, uh, for publications, they have little things on watermarks on them that prevent you from using images. Yep, images. Yeah, good point. So images, so images, those type of things. There's some type of watermark or digital copyright. Until you purchase, then that then that thing will go away. But no matter what you do, um, you know, and they'll also put protection if you, because you, you know, I think most people try to right click. It won't right click. You can't save it. You can't do anything because it has a digital protection on it. Prevent people from from doing that. Uh, and again, I put on risk managers should be aware of copyright infringement by the company they work for to make sure that employees aren't violating copyright in, in what they're doing. The next method is to registration. So obviously you can put the copyright notice. That's one way to provide for, to do that. Uh, the next, you know, kind of next level up is you can register it to obtain the full protection of law and you register with the U.S. Copyright Office. And so when that happens, owners would file a form with two samples of the published work. Uh, registration must be filled within three months of the date of the work is published or before the infringement occurred. Um, so th what that means is, you know, um, if I do it within three months or even if I did it later, but at least I did it before there's an you know, uh, a claim of infringement, then at least it still will be protected. Registration provides copyright owners with reasonable evidence of ownership rights. And registration allows a copyright owner to collect statutory damages up to 100,000 plus attorney's fees. So basically, if you just say someone's using your work, you can say stop it. You know, and, and you might be able to have a claim to you know, make them stop. But when you get, stat, get, get damages for it, that really only applies to registered work in that case. So when we videotape a show, mm -hmm. we're violating a, we're infringing on someone's uh, copyright. You know, like with the NFL, they have that disclaimer mm -hmm. at the beginning. But we download football games. Mm -hmm. so, we so, so, well, that's actually a good point. So, like DVRs. So, everyone, you know, most people have DVRs and they're recording a game to watch it later. The main issue with a copyright is that if you're trying to make money off of what you're doing. So, if you're in a um, do that and then you want to show it off and replay it and have charge people five dollars to go see it, then then that would be more of the violation of the copyright. If you're trying to do more of a public um, you know, performance of it, then that then that's where those issues become uh, on there. I believe the Supreme Court has ruled that if you use it simply to time shift to watch it yourself at a different time, that is explicitly not a copyright yeah. violation. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, good, good point. And and that's and that's and that's always an issue of okay, well, um, you know, people that own bars and they have that. Well, you know, again, it's it's all, it's being publicly broadcast or those type of things, and there's usually you know they're they're allowed to do that. Um, that also goes to the whole blackout things of, you know, certain times that, you know, can't watch games because of that, and if people try to circumvent that, and, and if they're able to do it, then they make money because of they're showing the game at a, at a bar, then, then that might be part of it, too. Um, they can also have restricted covenants. And so what this basically is, this is where when I talk about contracts. So if you have something in a contract that says um, that uh, so-and-so uh, can't use this work or, uh, who owns it, those type of things. That's the restricted covenant. It'll be a clause with an agreement uh, on termination of employment or contract restricts the post-termination activities of the employee or contracting party. The idea is if I'm doing, if I've published a certain type of um, play or whatever, whatever it might be, um, a book, 
And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, you know something, you can't do this type of consulting or this type of work as part of the agree employment agreement for at least a, you have to wait a year before you can work for another company that does the same type of thing. And that's not that uncommon. That's actually fairly common um, because they don't, it's, a, it's really more of a competition clause. But the idea is the restricted covenant really prevents people from using the material that they may have been part of developing um, because it's the organization that owns it, even though the person that may have created it, but they can't create a new work that might replicate it for a certain period of time. And that's where that comes, that idea. Uh, so the restrictive covenant restricts the post-termination activities of the employee or the contracting party. And uh, being a legally binding contract, a restrictive covenant provides an additional claim that an organization can assert when its copyrights are infringed upon. And again, that's the idea is that, okay, you have, not only did you have a copyright there, you had it registered, and then you also have a restrictive covenant and within you have an agreement. The, these, you can actually, yeah, each thing kind of layers on upon uh, each thing to be able to provide protections uh, of intellectual property or infringement rights. Uh, the last one is responses to anticipated defenses. So again, despite providing a copyright notice and properly registering the work, infringement may still occur. The defenses of an infringer may claim uh, the following responses, which uh, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, uh, laches, which is the infringers assert that the copyright owners waited too long to, came in, to claim infringement. Um, that um, that they, uh, they've been using it for a longer period of time, and so, hey, it's been common, and so, I've, hey, look, I've been doing this for 10 years, and now you're going to claim infringement? You know, that might be part of it. So when the infringement was hidden or difficult to discover, many courts allow additional time to bring an infringement claim, and the copyright owner must act in a timely manner once an infringement has been discovered. So once they have notification, it's kind of like, it's almost like, when does the statute of limitations start kind of idea? When, and, you know, when did they really know? Um, another doctrine, um, defense that's used, and, and uh, um, I, I'd probably say it's probably more, the most common, is the fair use doctrine. And it's probably more used by um, education and universities and other things because it's, it's something to, you know, in journalism, uh, to be able to convey and relay information. You just got to give it credit when you do it. So the infringers can claim their infringement was for the purpose of teaching, research, scholarship, criticism, or journalism, which have been recognized by some courts as legitimate exceptions. Um, so the idea is as long as you're giving credit, well, in this case, you know, well, I'm posting all these things of the book. Well, I'm a sponsored course. We're using the material for that. It's, you know, you can say, well, do we need, do I need to get permission for each and every page that I'm doing when I show, when I do a screenshot and stuff like that. That's not required as a sponsored course. Um, when uh, when I was using the Cure Guide, one of the things that they require is that just put the copyright of the Cure. You know, uh, when I do questions, as long as I show that, they don't care um, because they want people to buy it, buy it. And, and I'm not giving away the whole book, but I'll show certain portions of it. Um, innocent infringement. This defense allows infringers who admittedly but unintentionally infringe to cease their activity and pay only economic value of the material they use. Often arise when the copyright material's use has been uh, ha has been authorized in initial publication but not in subsequent works. Um, and so, you know, you can say, you know, uh, I'm not sure how much, you know, you can't say downloading music is innocent. My everyone knows that that's, you know, if you're downloading music that you're not supposed to, it's copyright, it's on the site. Yeah, I don't know, um, that's a hard claim. But that was the original claim that most of people had was, hey, this is innocent. I'm not, I'm not playing it with it. I'm not making money off it. I just want to listen for my own purposes. And that might have been more of an innocent infringement claim. Um, that they might use, and again, it depends on what the courts would, would find in that favor. Um, the, the last couple ones here are uh, licensing agreements. So the idea is that, well, you can let people use the works if you license it to them to be able to use it. So just as like uh, NFL or MLB type of shirts, well, they're an official licensed organizations to be able to use the logo of Major League Baseball. And so that does allow them, it grants them permission to use the copyright material through that agreement. Um, and it'll specify, you know, within there exactly how, you know, you just want to give a flame, oh, you can use it for anything. Well, then that, that, that opens up a whole can of worms of how they use it, what type of material, do you really want that logo on, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's something you don't want that logo that may tarnish your reputation, let's say, if it's on, on something. Um, so the, the type they might specify it has to be on um, certain type of material. And maybe it has to be made in the USA. Maybe it, I mean, they could specify in order to use this license, you have to meet these specific requirements. It'll have the duration. 
um, and uh, the controls the basically the licensor in this case controls the loss exposure. <coughs> so we do have a question that popped up here. So um, <clears throat> question in terms of copyright and trademark infringement of logos and insignias, if a logo is identified as belonging to the organization, to the Cal or UCLA script uh, on the football team helmets, if a youth football team or high school uses it, must they do with permission of UC Regents? Most of the organizations use the logos they use for fundraising purposes, also by selling t-shirts for the club. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure how we handle. I know that most of our things are licensed uh, at the university level. And I think there's a lot of similarities, you know, again, like on football helmets and those type of things. I think probably, you know, um, you know, if someone uses the Cal logo specifically, I mean, that, that definitely is, you know, or UCLA, the way the logos work. I do know that we don't allow anyone to use the UCCL or those type of things. Um, uh, matter of fact, we only let um, most of our vendors even say that they're doing work for us. Um, that's kind of, you know, it's in rare cases that we allow that to happen. Um, so we have to have permission if they want to do that. Um, but I don't, you know, it would be one of those cases whether we would want to go after, I mean, for a, another public organization, things like that, probably not. Um, you know, again, it depends on kind of the, whether it's real economic value. They're not really trying to make money off of it, but I understand where you're going with a fundraiser. That might be a little different case. It might actually be a reputational risk for us to pursue. Yeah, and the, yeah, if you start going after uh, Little League and um, those type of things, and actually that's good. Actually, a good example would be Little League. They're actually licensed to use a lot of times the logos uh, for the team because that helps promote. You know, I mean, obviously Little League baseball then promotes Major League baseball. And, and does it. So there's an advantage There's certain cases where they would want um, organizations to be able to use those logos as part of that. So trademarks. So now we move on to the trademarks. And, and basically trademarks uh, are a way that organizations differentiate their products from their competitors, uh, products in the marketplace, um, you know, to prevent their customers from being confused about whose products they are buying. And so, you know, you can think of all the trademarks, and they have a little TM symbol uh, that differentiate trademark. But, you know, Nike, just do it. Um, you know, we can think of, uh, trying to think of some of the other ones that are out there. Swish, yep. Swish is a trademark. I mean, you think of almost any type of logo that's out there. You know, A and F is, you know, Agricomi and Fitch is probably, you know, uh, trademark. And so the idea is it's not just the company's name. It's also, uh, it could be a saying. Um, something, you know, got milk. That's trademarked by the, what, the milk council. Um, you know, let's get ready to rumble Michael Buffer. That's, that's trademarked. A, that's a trademark. Yep, so let's get it ready. And so he's the only one. And so that's the thing. If, if someone else says it, um, they either have to pay, but usually they don't even allow anyone but him uh, to say that. He's making millions of Yep. That. Yep. I believe the Pacific Bell Yellow Pages failed to trademark there, let your fingers do the walking, oh. and the, the image of the fingers walking. So every other yellow book publication out there was able to take that and run with it. So just repeat, in case you can't hear, it's that the, the yellow pages failed to trademark the little, let your fingers do the walking with the little symbol, and then all the other different types of yellow pages were able to use that. So now again, that's where trademarks, um, you know, it's important if you come up with something that's unique, you, you probably want to trademark that. Um, and then state, federal, and international laws can be used to penalize an organization that copies a trademark if the trademark's owner has used for proper measures to control the loss exposure. Um, so again, you know, Major League Baseball has a trademark. The NFL, I mean, everyone has those. And so those are what's on, or, or a PGA golf. You know, they're, you know, they have symbols. That's what's on the shirt. That's what may sell the shirt is because it's a, an official PGA type thing. Trademarks are distinguished products. It should not be confused with service marks which are a way an organization differentiates services from competitors. Um, and it's, I'm, trying to think of, I'm trying to think of some other ways to describe a service mark, but, um, um, but you know, a trademark is, I guess you could probably say more of the, you know, some of the slogan type aspect, but you'll, a lot of times you'll see a trademark and you'll see you know, a service mark sometimes on, on material. But neither trademarks nor service marks should be confused with trade dress, in this case, which is the total image of a product or service that allows the product or service to be distinguished from the competition. So trade dress is really encompassing both of those, um, uh, you know, the image of that. Um, so the three important features uh, of, of trademarks, 
are going to, we think about that there's going to be certain categories, trademark categories, and how we create, and then also the duration of those. So when we think about the, the categories, there's the arbitrary mark, which is a word or phrase that appears to have been used randomly. Okay, well, Google, you know, so you think of the Google symbol, nonsensical word, but now we talk, now we, have, we Google everything. I mean, um, trying to think of, you know, there's, um, uh, well, there's some other ones out there. I can't, you know, mine's not, um, Instagram. Um, Vine, I mean, Vine is now, I mean, but these, I mean, they're not, it's arbitrary. It's not necessarily, you know, does it random? It's kind of, okay, what does it mean? It has some meaning now. But if you think about it, Google never had any meaning, you know, prior to that. But now it's, it's a common word. A fanciful mark, a word or phrase that conjures an image that is imaginative. So the swoosh would be a fanciful mark. Or a suggested mark, uh, one that is one that implies certain product qualities. Um, uh, and I think the like the U label, the U L, you get on yeah. the electronic the service mark. Would that be an example of a service? Um, mark? I'm not sure in that case. That, it might be. I, that that you know because it, you know it, it does speak to quality if yeah. it has a U L stamp, and, and that might be part of that. Um, but um, you know, I think like a pillow top type thing. It might be you know if they describe something that might be in this case that'd be more of a suggestive mark. Uh, the descriptive mark describes a product and emphasizes the product feature. Well, they, and that could also be, you know, so they give some examples a little bit more in the book. But the main thing to know is, you know, that, um, that the, the different ways, you know, what can be a trademark. You know, there's different ways they can do it uh, on there. Um, when they're created, created, when the mark is first used on a product or product marketing, uh, has two requirements. The mark must be distinctive. So it needs a unique symbol or logo. It can be a fabricated word, like we said, Google. Word that is unexpected in the context that is used, uh, a word that creates a fanciful image, or a word that describes a pro uh, product qualities. Um, so these are the things you know when we talk about what at what point can you say this is now we're going to make this a trademark. You just can't say I'm going to make a pencil a trademark. You know it's got to have so, so what's different about it? What are you going to do um, with that? You're, you know with the pencil to make it. You know maybe you bend it and you know do something different. I don't know what you do with the pencil to make it different, but or, or hmm? A flex pen, or, pen you know, yeah, it, it's a pen, but you can you flex it. But then your trademark, you know, or, you know, you can use something, but it would, it would have something to do of, you know, that, that may not necessarily be associated with a pen of how you're doing it or something. Uh, the trademark owner must be the first to introduce the trademark and accomplish. That's atta accomplished by attaching the trademark to the product. So if I create something, and um, so well, actually, a good example with UC, we've created, I would say, a trademark. We've got our ERM logo. So a logo could be a trademark with an umbrella and you know, and uh, enterprise risk management. And so that can be considered to be a trademark. When do we first use it? You know, do we put it on publications? We put it on other things. You know, if we start putting it on shirts, those okay. Now it is a trademark um, that we can now say that this is, um, you know, part of what we're doing. Except this rule occurs when another party files an intent to use trademark application uh, with the U.S. Trademark and Patent Office. So is there a search you do before you issue? Will you establish a trademark? So yeah, there's actually, um, so if you uh, if you go, I, I actually I went to the website today just as part of the research for it, um, uh, the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office, um, and it talks about how you can do searches and those type of things. So you can really get a determination of what's already out there. If it's a logo and, and you know, it's a little more difficult to do a trademark search if you're looking for uh, an, uh, kind of a picture, so you can, you can kind of get an idea of what trademarks are already out there. And the trademark usually has to be described. But, so a trademark in, entered on the, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office, principal register is protected for 10 years, or 20 years if registered before 89. And uh, the registration can last indefinitely if it's renewed every 10 years. So that's the other key factor is once you have, I mean, so technology transfer offices or whatever you have, after 10 years, if you don't redo it, you lose the trademark. And someone else can now pick up the trademark. And that's happened with other organizations. Uh, so it's something every 10 years, but it can be renewed forever, essentially. But it's up to the owner of that to make sure that they do renew that trademark uh, and keep track of that. Uh, now when we talk about risk control measures, if you look on the list, of some of the same things. Notice, registration are the same. Um, now the, the next ones, we're going to talk about searches and watches, uh, which basically you know, you want to look for, and this is looking for people that may be infringing on your trademark, 
when we talk about searches and watches. You can also, have, and then on the flip side, is licensing agreements to allow. Again, you have restrictive covenants you can do. And then the other part is enforcement of rights. So again, the notice, as we talked about, owner can register the trademark with the uh, uh, patent office, trade, uh, patent and, uh, trade office. Once registered on the principal uh, register, the mark should be shown with the symbol C to put on all notice. The mark actually circle. Um, this something. What did I do there? Okay. So I think I. Copyright. Yeah, I did use the wrong. I used the copyright symbol. So yeah. So it's registered as an R. Thank you. Uh, or it'll be. Or actually, uh, until registration, TM is used with the mark. So. Uh, so the mark's registered. The registration symbol can be used only if the trademark has been registered with the uh, trademark office. If, uh, if the mark has been registered and the symbol is not used, um, the protection is lost in lieu of registration. So you got to use the you got to use the protection because otherwise people don't know it's protected, and so you have to have both of those in place. Um, and it talks about risk management professionals should create a list of the registered marks, the diary, the trademarks, uh, ten-year renewal dates. Um, Boy, I've made a lot of mistakes in typing this. Um, uh, and it has two advantages. It creates a presumption that the company doing the registration is the owner, and it creates a nationwide notice. Um, so again, by registering, um, you know, it, it does, if someone says they didn't know, because they would, you know, um, if they tried to do something on their own, they should check the trademark office to make sure before, before they even use that type of mark. Searches and watches before a trademark registration um, and periodically thereafter, a search should be done to determine if someone else has a similar trademark or service mark or has applied for a similar mark. So uh, you can kind of see um, you know, what's going on out there. People are thinking the same type of thing. Um, usually what happens is when something, you know, a new uh, event, some people start just applying for trademarks and trying to just to get ahead of uh, something so then someone would have to buy it off of them in some cases. Uh, Linsanity. Linsanity was taking place. Okay, so that's right. Linsanity. Someone. Yeah. yeah. All right, and, and now a little different area where we talk about patents and, and some of the other things are you know people like with websites and that's more probably copyright but people will create. Um, well, no, that's more trademark. I think about because a trademark domain, domain name. Yeah, yeah. predatory domain would be more of a trademark okay. because that is if you create a domain name that has your name and well the <coughs> trademark is your name and then all of a sudden someone's creating all these sites. Now the courts have also found that that type of um, thing where they're, they're kind of doing this, they can't just create websites, um, to, especially if someone that's a celebrity with the anticipation that they'll want it. Um, or people will buy up every single name that biz.gov, .org, .whatever, and that'll be something there too. They do that during election time, you know, like uh, Go or something like that. I mean, or, or, uh, you can think of. Or, or wasn't it uh, Rick, uh, Rick Santorum? Um, someone had already done that, and they created, um, you know, or they changed. They, they did a thing of when you Google Santorum. That's uh, a different issue. That was a different issue. That's okay, Google bombing is a different issue. <laughs> yeah, Google, Google, but they did something different. But they created a different site, I think, when the people looked it up. So, but that, yeah, there's some different issues of how people may use technology for maybe not the best purposes. Um, so searches and watches, you want to keep out for that. License agreements um, should be, uh, you know, allow someone else to use the mark. And again, that goes more into how, uh, you know, NFL, Major League Baseball, they allow their trademark to be used, and that's part of the licensing agreement. They're an officially licensed uh, area. We talked about restrictive covenants, same type of thing. Owner has the additional protection created by the agreement. The owner can assert that the other party is not an innocent infringer because by signing the restrictive covenant, has actual knowledge of the existence of the trademark. Um, so again, someone leaves the company and says, oh, I'm going to keep on using the symbol. Well, you know, now they're infringing, and especially if it was specifically excluded for them to do uh, to do that. And then once you have, uh, you find infringers, you can enforce your rights. Uh, infringers should be dealt with in a timely manner with a cease and desist letter or notification of intent to sue. Uh, so typically, um, where I've seen this is in Sacramento, we have Monster Golf. I mentioned uh, earlier to, to Emily that um, you know it's golf, but the only issue is the Monster Golf logo looks exactly like the logo of Monster Energy Drinks. So they did; it was in the papers that they received a cease and desist letter, um, and so they were basically they just had to stop using it. Um, in this case, there was not necessarily any penalties paid, um, or 
some locations will, you know, if it's McDonald's pharmaceutical, they might try to, they'll use the same logo of the M or something like that. You know, even though it's a different type of item, they can certainly go after for infringement in that case because they're using the trademark look to make people think that it might be something similar. All right, patents. So um, patents are a legal uh, protection and right grant by the U.S. government that gives the owner the ability to control who makes, sells, or imports for sale his or her invention for a limited period of time. And then the length of time really depends on the category that's granted. And it goes into all the different issues of, you know, how many years and things like that. Um, but we see all the commercials for patents, you know, um, from a university setting. Universities probably create more patents than uh, any private sector company. I think, um, if I'm, at least from a couple of years ago, I know the UC system on its own uh, produced more patents. Um, I think over like 300 patents a year is kind of what we've typically done on average. Um, and that could be, um, you know, whatever, uh, artificial heart, um, all those types. I mean, you think of all the things that have come from research, and, and so there's just a lot of things that do come from research as part of that. So the types of patents, uh, there's three, the three types, and we'll talk about a utility patent, which is a patent issued for an invention or a process that has some utility or usefulness, um, and, it do, and it does have to work. Um, so, so what's that? No perpetual motion machine. Yeah, no perpetual motion machine, things like that. The, um, you know, you think, okay, well, everything out there, okay, bicycles have a patent, there's, um, you know, the iPhone, I mean, all these different things have patents. And the issue is, um, how is something different? So there was, a, uh, you know, in, in every piece of like an iPhone, there might be a thousand patents specifically with the iPhone or the different features, so they patent a different technology. I believe one of the patents that was part of a recent case was when you kind of use your fingers to, you know, kind of spread and you expand or you, you know, contract a page by doing that. There was a specific patent for that. And um, so now with technology, though, um, it's kind of saying, well, that's kind of common, you know, so can people really, you know, is that a true patent uh, anymore? Um, but so that, that's one of the issues. Um, uh, you know, so 20 years from application date is what, how long the patent lasts. In the book they tell us says, well, it takes, you know, 17, you know, really it's effective 17 years because it'll just take three years. The difference on the utility patent, it's when the patent, um, um, the, the on utility patents, it's on the application date is when the clock starts ticking on the 20 years. On the rest of the design patent and the, and the plat patent, it's from the date of issuance. So um, that's the that, three years apart. Well, the three years, what they basically said is that, uh, and the, what they talked about in the book, and they said, well, it's effectively only 17 years because typically for a patent to go through the patent process to go through that, it's going to take three years to go through there. So even though you may have been you know, a lot of times you'll have patent, so that's why it says patent pending for a long time for these things. It's because it takes a lot longer for the process to be able to go through. Um, you think about patent, so useful inventions, okay? Cups that have built-in things so you don't get burned. Uh, uh, so coffee cups. Now you see instead of having the little, uh, the, the uh, sleeve that goes on it, you now some are built with that have some, uh, you know, kind of thing that's kind of insulation built into it. Um, there's a patent on the, the, the cap, so when you, you know, how you're going to drink it. I mean, there's all these different things that can be, there's a patent on everything. Uh, so people are trying to make money on each of those different different areas. Um, and then you have a design patent, which is a patent issued for design that is new or innovative, or that is ornamental or aesthetic in nature. Um, and then, uh, then you also have a, a plant patent, which is a patent issued for biological, asexual, reproducing plant that is new. Um, so if you, you know, if people might say, okay, well, Monsanto, and you know, that might be a lot of people consider that bad word with, you know, some of the genetically engineered type of thing, but that's kind of where those patents is. There's there's new products that you know that's, you know, pest resistant or drought resistant or whatever the case might be, and those are 17 years from the date of issuance. Um, again, so some examples when we talk about. Utility patent is, you know, examples, machine, article, manufacturing, chemical compound. So most of the utility things are really going to be pharmaceutical, uh, you know, patents. And so they have a certain lifespan on the pharmaceuticals. So we talk about chemical compound. Um, the design ornamental features of a product is like, well, we decided to put little bells on whatever. That made it unique or it's different enough 
because of the way that we designed the way this book. So it might be more of um, the way a couch is designed or some other type of features that might be part of a new material that's used. Um, well, um, my mind's going like oh, pillows. Those uh, memory foam. Thank you. I'm talking talk about memory. I can't even think of memory foam. So you know, memory foam that might be part of it as well. Uh, okay. So actually, uh, so I did uh, official source of data. Uh, someone did uh, look up why we're talking about the number of patents. So UC had 343 patents in 2011, and according to the report, the UC has generated a total of about 155 million dollars. Um, from its top 25 inventions and about 182 million from all of its inventions combined since their creation. So, uh, so yeah. So again, the, you can see the value of intellectual property and the, and the patents uh, when we do look at things like that. Okay. So to be eligible for a patent, the invention must be new, useful, and non-obvious. And non-obvious in this case uh, means that the invention displays a level of innovation or produces results that are unexpected when compared to previous developments in that area um, or prior art. The invention must be non-obvious to someone with ordinary skill in that particular field. Um, and so someone could say, okay, well, a unicycle compared to a three-wheel cycle, to a two-wheel, to a four, I mean, is there, you know, are the differences or maybe the, the way the sprockets are different. The gear changing might be different. So the bike itself may be the same type of material, but the patent is, it's going to be the patent on that one function. Um, a good example, at least from a safety standpoint, um, there's actually a bandsaw that, um, um, dang, my mind just went blank again. Anyways, there's a, um, there's a saw blade, saw stop, that basically, um, they have a patent on the technology that when, um, well, Flash, but basically a moisture type of material touches the blade, the blade will automatically stop. Now there's a, so the blade, you know, the blade's not new, the, you know, the, the table's not new, it's all the same thing. The technology's in this thing that automatically basically stop the blade uh, and, and motion. And so that's where the patent is. Um, and interestingly enough, what's been, uh, the inventor of the soft stop has been trying to sell it to other companies and they don't want to buy it not because of the pricing issues, but they're concerned about the liability if something happens and it doesn't work. Um, so, um, but uh, yeah, it's a little different there. So you, know, you kind of see with a risk management perspective whether you want to get into that patent area. Patent applications must be filed in the inventor's name and or all names who were involved in the creation. And I want I highlight this because of the NPR story that was done recently and it had to uh, deal with like file storage. You know, there's um, all these companies now that have off, um, or backups and things like that. And so there was a company, uh, a person that bought the patent uh, and was trying and was suing all these companies for patent infringement. And it had to do with uh, you know the idea that you know this file storage and anyone that was using it had to pay this license fee. What the reason why they got torn out of court is because when this idea and again it was all about an idea that was created. That's what he patented was the idea to be able to make something like this. He didn't create the code for it just had the idea for it um, and what it might look like and what it would do. The, the, uh, it was thrown out of court and the guy um, already had collected several hundred million dollars off of these patent lawsuits. Um, there was documentation to show that there's other people that were involved in the discussions and therefore they had to be listed on the patent too and since they were not, it's an invalid patent. It no longer is viable. So. That's um, nothing, you know, something di different, it's not in the book, but that kind of shows why um, who's involved, all the inventors and or all names who are involved in the creation need to be listed or at least be, have given the option to opt out of doing the patent. And uh, the, those, the, luckily the, per the people that were involved were still alive and said, no, I was part of it and there's documentation, um, letters or faxes that actually showed that this person was doing stuff at the time. Uh, the patent invention may assign these rights to another party at any time, and that's where people can buy the patents. And then um, inventors who sign or invent for hire agreements with their employer often do this. And so, and that's what UC does is essentially uh, we do require all of our employees to sign uh, agreements uh, that basically we have the rights of the ownership that goes to the UC regents in this case. Uh, risk control measures, same type of thing, you know, no same, okay, notice requirements, same uh, idea there. Licensing agreement, restrictive covenants, and freedom to operate search. So 
I'm not going into detail on those because we already talked about the same thing when we talk about those, but what's new is the freedom to operate search. And what this is, it's a search reviews prior art and current patent applications to ensure the invention under development does not infringe an existing patent. Um, so we see on TV um, the commercials for, you know, the patent, you know, you know um, send your invention to us, we'll, we'll be the company. What they're trying to do is that they're, they're saying they'll do all the work, give us the, you know, they'll buy the, the you know, they'll buy the idea off you um, and essentially or buy the patent and then they'll end up reselling it to make the money off of it. Um, and part of the, what the service they'll do is they'll look to see is there anything already existing and they'll do that before they obviously, you know, take your idea because um, if it's already out there, then of course they don't want to spend any money. The last area of intellectual property we'll talk about is trade secrets. And so a trade secret um, is, uh, is created automatically without a formal application process and courts will answer the following questions to determine the trade secret status. Um, so how well is the secret known outside the business? How much of the secret is disclosed to employees? What steps are taken to guard the secret? What is the secret's commercial value? And how hard is it for someone else to get the secret? So the idea is that if everyone knows in the company the trade secret, well, it's not really a secret. Um, you know, so if only certain people, only the CEO or only this one person knows, or maybe only this person knows this much of the secret, another person knows this part of the secret, and then that would be a basis for that truly is a trade secret. Um, you know, what state, you know, what steps are taken to guard the secret? Again, that might be part because not everyone knows. Um, what's the value again? What, can you put a value on the Coca-Cola recipe? Can you put a value on, again, KFC, these other things? I mean, there's certain things, um, that have obviously, um, with Truvia and some of these other type of, you know, diet stuff. I mean, there's, there's, t almost every company has some type of trade secret that they're trying to protect. Uh, or it may be in uh, their algorithm of, of uh, how they determine credit scores is a trade secret for the credit rating agencies. They're not going to disclose that. Um, they're not going to put a patent, but that might be a trade secret for them on how they do that. Um, and again, the trade secret remains in force as long as the secret can be maintained. Uh, the risk control measures, uh, um, obviously. You know, most importantly, disclose the information only to those employees you need to know. Uh, obviously, that's the first one. Require a sign-in or similar security measure to gain access to the area where the secret information is used. So it's only, it's only in the safe. Only certain people would even be able to allowed in this type of room. Um, it's in, um, you know, uh, um, you know, just a secure area. However, that might be control any documentation regarding the secret by using a safe, uh, a confidential stamp, or a burn bag. Um, not a lot of burn bag, but I guess that can be used as well. Um, require employees to sign a restrictive covenant in the form of non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement. And that's probably the more common thing is that even if they know parts of it, they need to sign a non-disclosure. And, um, you know, it, it obviously those don't necessarily work because, you know, even from espionage on NSA, you know, those type of things, you know, someone can at any point decide, okay, I'm just going to divulge what I know, whether it's a trade, you know, obviously, and it's a little different than trade secret uh, from recipes and things like that, but uh, it kind of gets the same areas that how do you protect secrets is essentially the same idea. So how do you put a value on intellectual property? IP is an organization's most valuable commodity, but it's also the most difficult to inventory and quantify. Because you think about it, if, again, we use Coca-Cola or whatever, if, if all of a sudden the KFC's recipe went out, okay, uh, then everyone can start doing it. Not that everyone wants to eat deep fried chicken all the time, but, um, you know, that, you know, what's the value that they could lose based upon that? If other companies started opening up and they go, hey, we got this, you know, the same type of recipe. Uh, so IP is essentially in, uh, information and ideas, and it's difficult to assign a specific value, uh, but it's critical to an organization's identity, market share, competitive advantage, and overall worth. So um, it's kind of one of those things most, most companies really don't realize the value of the intellectual property that they have. Um, you know, for public agencies, there's not uh, IP is a little different type of case. But when we're talking, you know, public sector or excuse me, private sector, and I would say even in research organizations, um, there's a lot of value to intellectual property because that can generate revenue for, you know, uh, for future patents, inventions that can generate money for. So it's kind of more of a profit-seeking type of organization, um, even though most people may not consider university profit-seeking. The reality is, is that. It's trying to recoup dollars, if nothing else. 
uh, reasons for proper appraisal of IP. When unauthorized use of IP is determined, organization must put monetary value for litigation purposes. So the, the reason why we're looking at why you want to value it is that, or um, you know, why you want to get an appraisal of your IP at some point. Um, because if you do have, you know, someone using it, you need to have an idea prior to litigation what it might be worth. The idea is that you can also sell that IP or license it. And if you don't know what the full value is, you may not be able to maximize your profits on it. Um, most mergers and acquisitions, the reality is, is what they're buying in many cases uh, is a lot of times will be the intellectual property of the company. You know, um, so what? Uh, Facebook bought Instagram, right? right? So Instagram has certain intellectual property or it might be competition that they would want to have. So they bought the code for Instagram. I think they bought the code for whatever. I mean, you look at all the different companies, what they're, what they're buying is the intellectual property uh, of, of the company. They can probably care less about the building those type of things, the intellectual property has a certain value, and they need to know, well, part of it is how well their intellectual property is protected, because if everyone knows the code, then there's no point in not buying it. Um, and so that's the other part, of that, that goes into the, uh, the valuation of it. Eliminating competition. So eliminate, you know, part of it is eliminating competition, which may make it more valuable once you buy it up, because, um, uh, or if, you know, um, you know, again, Facebook may, is the, you know, has the site, and, you know, you not that they need to buy MySpace and all that, but each of them are a little different. But obviously, if you think about the algorithms, I mean, the, the intellectual property that Facebook has to where how different advertising pops up on a page when you're on it, the, the um, or Google, actually Google's an even better one, because now when you do a search, I mean, Google anticipates, they know what you're looking for. Scary. They can sell that information. Uh, of what you're looking for, and and so that I mean the reality is is data now is probably more more and more valuable uh, than than most things because now they can target you know the ability to target message uh, those type of uh, advertising is, is key. Might be used as a source of financing or securitization. If we say you know again you look at Facebook, you know um, the idea what people were buying was the code that's intellectual property. There's there was no there there there's no product to sell, but because of the code had a certain value, you were able to get loans, you were able to get people to invest. And so, you know, and, and so a lot of times um, you think of Steve Jobs of Apple, you know, the intellectual property that he had just from maybe from generating ideas, you know, he made, you know, obviously there's the products, but the, I, to be the idea person, there's a certain value that that presents, and also stock prices then, you know, are, are related to that. Uh, depending on the value, it can affect accounting and taxation treatment, depending on how that's going to be handled. Um, and also, probably from a risk man perspective, um, determine the um, proportion of risk management resource to protect the value. <clears throat> if you know how much th this IP is worth, you're going to do more things to make sure you protect it. You're going to have insurance. You're going to put all. You're going to put more safeguards in to make sure you do the notice requirement, to do the registration, to do the restricted covenants. You're going to spend more dollars or resources. So part of it's somewhat of a risk appetite. If your intellectual value deemed is not okay, if someone got it, big, no big deal then you're not going to put a lot of resources into protecting the intellectual property. So it really depends on how you want to move forward with that. So um, actually, I'll one, one of those actually I think is a good one um, uh, that I talk about. But um, so, you know, Shoes for Cruise is one of the products that we use with UC. And um, they have their shoe has a you know, high coefficient of friction where people you know, prevent from slipping fall. Well, the, 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 their, um, their intellectual property in this case is how they make the rubber. Uh, as well as the design of of, of the, the tread on the bottom. And, you know, so they have a patent. No one else can now produce that as long as that patent exists, produce something similar. Now, there's a lot of companies that are trying to do something like that. But the value of what they've created, you know, if they were to, you know, if they were to lose that or if they lost that trade. So the trade secret portion, I mean, that might be their patent on there. You know that might last longer, and that's the issue. At what point do you want to make a trade secret a patent? You know, in some cases you may, some cases you may not want to. It just depends on, you know, uh, because the thing is, once the patent's out, at some point it will expire, uh, and then anyone can make a generic drug or a generic whatever. But at least with a trade secret, it's life as long as you protect the secret. So evaluation methodologies. Uh, we have fair market value approach. Um, which is the most common approach for formal IP valuation. And, and the reason why I put that on this is because when you read this, 
the next one talks about income approach is the most prevalent, which I'm not sure the difference between formal and prevalent, but that's the way they described it. Um, but the idea is that fair market is used more for valuation reports and standard, and it's a standard used by the IRS in most courts when they look at it. Um, and the idea is that the that what's the value of if if you were to sell this, what a willing buyer and seller uh, would would pay for it. Um, and again, most of the time you may not be selling it, but the idea is that's how you put some type of values. If I was to try to sell this, what would someone pay for the company, uh, or you know, or Facebook? You know, if someone would say, okay, I want to buy Facebook. Well, that's all intellectual property. I don't care about the buildings. I want the code. What is that worth? And um, you know, and that's probably the, where the valuation approach comes in. The income approach assigns current value to IP based on the discounted cash flows the property will generate over its useful life. Um, so uh, in, in the idea that talks about most effective method for risk management purposes, it incorporates risk factors that may affect price. So you think about discount rate changes uh, or technology or regulatory risk. So generic drugs, you may say, okay, this is going to generate X amount of income for a certain period of time until the generic drug comes on the market and then it's pretty much going to drop. Um, now what, you know, in cases uh, um, that most pharmaceutical companies are doing, they, uh, you know, uh, as I've read, is they kind of just tweak it enough to kind of say, okay, it's, it's new. So you have Claritin, you have Claritin D, you've got this, you've got, you know, so it's now and that way they can renew the patent. Or if you can find a new use for it. Or a new use for it different condition exactly, then you can re repurpose it uh, to be able to sell it that way. But again, when you think about income, you can, you know, you can say the cash flows, you can have an idea of, again, KFC, what does that generate? What is the income that the product actually generates from it? Uh, not just what, if I was to sell the company, you know, might have a different valuation. And the cost approach assigns the value based on what, really what your development costs are. If I, it cost me $10,000 to develop this, um, then the you know the idea is well it's only worth ten thousand dollars if no if there's no willing buyer that's the only way you might be able to value that um, that, that that no one would pay more uh, for the intellectual property than what it cost to create and and the idea is in that case um, you know I'm not sure what the value if it really has a lot of value it kind of depends on on that so we go to reputation risk switching gears. And so reputation is an intangible asset that relates to an organization's goals and values, results from behaviors and opinions of its stakeholders, and grows over time. And the key thing um, that on the next point is an organization maintains a good reputation when it meets or exceeds stakeholder expectations. Now, stakeholders can be internal, external. They can be stockholders. They can be the media, um, um, just general public. And so the idea is that when you know maintain a good reputation, we can think of companies in our mind that go, oh, yeah, they have a great reputation. And so, and it talks about you know reputation equity in the book. Well, you can get little dings here and there, but they still got pretty good reputation equity. So how do we manage risk reputation? Um, and the key concepts that we're going to talk about reputation is a key a key asset that, um, unfortunately, organizations may not put enough value on reputation as an asset, but it truly is. It's just like People talk about political capital, you know, there's reputation capital that you build up. And there's key sources of risk when we talk about reputation. And then there's some systemic approach to managing reputation risk, and we can talk about implementation. So one thing I added to the slides uh, after I, I sent them out to everyone um, was, um, you know, reputation risk. So um, for those in, uh, I even, not, even with UC, most people recognize uh, this photo is from UC Davis. Um, and this was the infamous pepper spray incident. Uh, little old UC Davis made Al Jazeera. Um, so, yeah, uh, so it made every international news story. I mean, it was the, the press for a long period of time, and this was the photo that was pretty much shown. Now, uh, from a reputation standpoint, again, reputation is not something you can buy insurance for. It had, you know, we talk about the, you know, from, you know, the, um, you know, meet or exceed, you know, our stakeholder expectations. Okay, well, at a university setting, this is not your expectation of how students might be treated or police, I mean, all those type of things. Uh, you know, not going to right or wrong, all those type of things, but the idea is, is that, you know, the, so an incident like this, you know, what's the cost to the university? Well, do I want to send my kids there? Uh, the alumni, do I want to have, you know, do I want to keep donating dollars to the university? Um, 
do um, from a you know police standpoint? You know, do I feel safe reporting something to police? I mean, I don't. You know, the, you know, there's just all those things that, that may be part. Not to mention the lawsuits, but, um, also in the cost to to do that. And I would probably say the after effects of saying, okay, how do we make sure this never happens again? Part of it, there's studies done, Robinson Edley study, and some others that now have implemented that have law. I mean, which is they're good because it, you know changes were made uh, based upon this, but it's also a lot of you know time and resources that were spent in on this. Was he the only one who lost his job? No, the chancellor. Um, you know, the, well, some people were asking me you know, of the chancellor to, uh, to to resign in this case. Um, that it was more. I mean, there was different votes. I mean, there's no. There's um, uh, no. She's Chancellor Katani still uh, still there. But the chief of police uh, resigned. Um, the, the gentleman here um, also. I think there's two others that ended up resigning as part of this. Um, so reputation is a key asset, and the idea is reputation and intrinsic and in tangible value, and they kind of call it goodwill reserve or reputational equity, uh, with the potential to generate or erode future value. So the idea is what we do, you know, how can we do good things that we can get how people see us? Reputation uh, not uh, quantifiable on a financial statement, but is based on beliefs of stakeholders. So you're not going to be able to say it's worth the X amount of dollars, but you know, if you lose about a business or you say we're losing this many students because of that incident, well, you might be able to quantify it a little bit. Um, but again, it's more based on the beliefs of the stakeholders. Um, managing reputational risk, identify, you know, the key is to identify key stakeholders and prioritize relative importance uh, as the expectations and perceptions may vary based upon who the stakeholders are. So what that means is that, okay, we identify uh, risk uh, from a stakeholder, parents. You know, look at the incident that we had, parents, students, um, alumni, and then you take a look at that. Or, you know, what what did they expect? In many cases, at least in this, I would say for our purposes, their expectations are probably the same. <laughs> they weren't too off, but other organizations might have different or, or different stakeholders or different situations may have some different expectations. Then you got to prioritize which ones do you want to address first from a reputation standpoint. How do you get those uh, from a trust level? So you have an internal stakeholders, you know, employees. You're going to have to. Uh, be cognizant of or board of directors, and then you have external, which it might be uh, those. And then it talks about the power interest matrix, which is in the right-hand corner. So the idea is if you have, um, you know, those that have, um, in this, the way this slide is showing, um, you know, high, the people that have high power and high interest in an issue, uh, you want to exceed your maximum efforts uh, in trying to do this. If there's low interest uh, on the parts of the stakeholders um, and they don't exert very much power, you're probably you know minimal efforts of what you're going to try to do uh, to appease them. Then you know high interest, but there's little power. You want to keep those informed. So this is just the you know a little matrix that they uh, put on there to kind of get an idea there. The key risk sources: um, threats to reputation, um, legal regulatory noncompliance. Um, so if we're dumping things uh, legally. Um, or, um, you know, and this could also be violation of employment practices laws, things like that. Unethical behavior on part of a board or senior management. Um, and you could talk about reputational risk in terms of just individual risk, okay? So what's Bob Filner, the mayor of San Diego? Uh, I think his, risk, his reputation level is pretty much in the dumps now uh, as a board. But he also now, that his behavior um, now puts the rest of the city council in a position to have to respond. What are they going to do? Um, and what they do, you know, saying, okay, should he keep his job? Should they say, you know, he's not, I mean, that, that, that it's going to reflect on them into the, into the governance of the city, essentially. And then filing of major lawsuits uh, can be a threat to reputation. One of the things that, um, you, know, I, you know, I kind of probably put out there is, you know, if you think of companies that have great reputation, you know, Southwest for different, you know, areas, okay, on-time performance, they're a great people company, you know, you, that, that you have this image that you have in your head, about Southwest. When people think of Walmart, unfortunately, they, 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 they may think low prices, but then the other part they think about, they don't take care of their employees. Or they have all these things, they're overworked, they have, I mean, and, and that's part of, unfortunately, I mean, if you look at what they've tried to repair the reputation numerous times with different activities, but nothing's really caught on. Um, and, it, and so, that, I mean, it, it has a certain thing of would you want to work, I mean, and, I mean, so it has a certain 
stigma to it now. When you think of Walmart, you think, you know, yes, you think low prices, you might want to go there for that, but would I ever want to work there? No, probably not. I mean, cause, because would you be treated fairly? And that, that's just part of how people think about it now. And again, you can think positive, negative. The banking industry as a whole, reputation-wise, or the mortgage industry has a certain reputation. You know, how do how do companies, um, or you see now as a reputation, you know, as a, as a stellar, you know, research institution, you know, um, and you know, so universities have a certain reputation we want to uphold. That's part of it as well. And what can deflate some of that reputation if we, you know, those type of things. Um, I would say one of the things that universities, from a reputation standpoint, that uh, universities are constantly dealing with, not just us, is the issue of executive pay. Uh, whenever there's a new president, new chancellor, what makes the papers is so-and-so is making this amount of money, and is that right for a public agency to, for someone to be paying that much? And that becomes a challenge of, well, how do you recruit people that are, you know, that, to do a certain job? And, you know, because the public sector, the idea is, well, they shouldn't be making as much, and then um, and so the whole thing, there's a, you know, with the new president coming on, um, you know, the fact they've really highlighted that she's making less than the current president because they're trying to get out of, oh, because if they said that she's making $200,000 more, then there'd just be even more uproar. But that kind of deflated a little bit some of those claims of, oh, my gosh, you know, another it's one's making too much money. Also pointing out that this is the 25th percentile, so 75 percent of university presidents make more. Exactly, and that was the other point. Those, yeah, they're very clear, and that's the concern of of those. But you know, you look at major companies where people are making billions of dollars uh, and getting all these things, um, and and uh, so it's just how people look. Public sector shouldn't be making money because it's a public institution versus, but it's a large, you know, 24 billion dollar institution. Uh, when you look at other companies where people are making, you know, uh, a lot more on that. So there's also the upside to risk when we think about, you know, leverage opportunities to enhance reputation. Uh, green technology might be part of that when we think about, you know, um, how we can enhance our reputation. And so I put on there the three P reports, people, planet, profit. So Southwest does a three P report. They talk about how they're benefiting, you know, they, they really use that um, uh, with their new plan. I mean, I fly Southwest enough because I'm flying over the state. Um, that you know the reports they talk about is that the new design they're using the the materials in their um, uh, their seats are less caustic or they're more renewable they're not, they're less weight makes makes the plane more um, efficient and flying uses less uh, you know CO two and all that so it's just you know a good example of of how you can leverage a good situation but source of risk need to be identified um, in order to protect and take advantage of its reputation. Okay, so the key drivers of reputational risk and sources of risk, what they, what this, I think this is a good example, when we think about reputation, what really has an effect? And so we have all these different things, regulatory and legal compliance can have an impact. Communications and crisis management, how do we handle a situation? Um, you know, BP, good example, that, you know, poor price communication affected the reputation. Financial performance and long-term investment value. Corporate governance and leadership, you know, um, uh, the, um, Jamie Dimon, you know, with that whole issue of, you know, of losing all the money in a, in a bad trading, a corporate social responsibility, a workplace talent and culture, uh, which I think that's kind of more the Walmart aspect is right there as well as probably regulatory and legal, and then also delivering on, comfort, on customers' promises. Those all things can affect reputation. Uh, the thing they talk about in here is you want to view the organization as a system uh, or the, what they call the essential triangle that interacts and presents uh, uh, that interact and present risk to reputation. So you have stakeholders, um, you know, it can be inside, outside, internal, external. You have the environment uh, as well, which you're operating, and then you have uh, the resources uh, that make that are part of that. And then the next piece of this, the key drivers of reputation center around the three ethical dimensions. So what are the goals and missions of the organization? What are the rules or laws and regulations that we need to comply with? And what are the values that the organization has to deal with? So the goal is to examine the mechanism of reputation through the key drivers and the ethical dimensions. So we think about, okay, the, the idea of stakeholders, how does that, how do stakeholders view the issue with the goals and missions, or how do they view what we're doing in terms of the rules and laws and regulations, that all these things really interact and they have a play on here. And we'll show that in a minute. The three common factors um, of how com you know, the, the, the companies that do a good job of uh, managing reputational risk Companies quickly recognize events that pose a risk to reputation. They identify them early. They have an idea, 
or I mean, if they didn't identify that there's a potential reputational risk issue, um, that then as once it does happen, they react very quickly. Um, rapidly made important decisions to manage the risk. So once they knew it, they, they took effective action. And then companies' leadership and culture played key roles in successfully managing the risk. It's how they operated. And the examples um, that they provide in the book of the mechanism here is they took a look at, if you look at the dimensions, it says goals and missions. So here's our you know, ethical dimensions, rules, laws, and regulations, and values. And then we look at, cor you know, the other areas are uh, corporate so social responsibility. Is the company viewed by stakeholders as a good citizen? Do the company actions reflect its stakeholders' long-term interests? Does the company minimize the negative impact on um, and maximize positive impact of its business activities? Or workplace talent and culture on the values and this is the internal forces. Does the company recruit, hire, and train to develop high-quality employees? How does the company treat its employees? So that kind of goes to the whole Walmart thing we just talked about is workplace talent culture and what are the values that people hold is part of that. So it's this whole circular type of thing. Everything somewhat interconnects. In this case, we're talking about stakeholders, environment, all these different aspects are all kind of combined. The example that they talk about in the book of a good, you know, how you manage risk or a reputational event. And so um, many probably remember the time all product recall where seven people died after someone, um, you know, basically tampered with uh, some of the products. And once they recognized it, I mean, they made the decision. They basically they pulled everything and they pulled all the product. So that was a major, but what that demonstrated was that they're willing to take action. They took it quick. It was very decisive action. And basically they put, you know, uh, people above profits in this case. And that's kind of the example. They did the right thing, not saying, oh, we're going to hold off. You think about product recalls of vehicles. No, we're going to hold off. We'll wait, you know, those type of things. And finally it gets to the point where the pressure so much and now they look bad because they didn't do, the, they didn't do it at the right time. They were, their hands were forced. Tylenol wasn't, you know, or Johnson Johnson wasn't forced necessarily. They took it before they, you know, they didn't wait for the government to say, you need to pull this off. They did it on their own. Um, and so the decision making uh, was guided by its credo, uh, decided to take a stream proactive approach to the Tylenol poisonings, and implement immediate nationwide Tylenol product recall, cease Tylenol production, uh, Tylenol product advertising, and revolutionize the packaging. And what happened with this is that um, you know, then the top management talks about leadership culture, leading by example, following the company's credo, place consumer safety first of heady, uh, ahead of any concerns about any effect on profit. And I think, again, that's, that's a key component there. Um, you know, on the plus side, now when you think of Tylenol, you think of all the, you know, maybe may, may people don't, may not remember it, but now um, you, you think about um, the packaging. I mean, that revolutionized packaging for the way, you know, um, people buy, you know, over-the-counter medications. Another example that's not in the book, but I point out is uh, Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box had the food, you know, the, the um, uh, food poisoning incident where actually several young people died. And you know, I think it was mainly in Washington State where it happened. Well, from a reputation standpoint, um, you know, where they may not handle, you know, very well in the beginning, they were able to recover and um, credit to whoever thought of bringing Jack back because the whole idea of bringing the clown head back, because they, they, they went back to this, the, the idea is that Jack brought credibility back to the organization, that they're going back to their roots. That was the whole messaging is that when they brought Jack back, it's, hey, we're, we're, we're going to go back to what we did before. We're going to make sure the quality. And the idea is that when Jack left, when they stopped using it, the quality went down, those type of things, they didn't pay attention. But when they message Jack is back, it, it put a mind there again. And now you look at, they turn around, I mean, that could have completely destroyed a, a company. Last slide we have, and, um, so on this tonight is, um, you know, risk management principles for reputation risk must be viewed holistically and implemented actively and monitored. And these are the three components that you want to look at is identify, evaluate, and prioritize risks. So once you identify that there's a reputation risk, um, you know, identify, evaluate, and prioritize what those reputational risks are. Um, evaluate the tangible consequences of increased or decreased in, uh, a reputation and prioritize it. Once we identify those, we prioritize and develop and implement, implement risk response plan. The idea is that if something happens, it shouldn't be a surprise. You should have a plan and say, okay, this happened, let's deal with it, this is what we're going to do about it. And part of that is to determine the risk appetite, whether risk is treatable and, uh, on cost of, and what the cost of treatment might be. Because if you have no idea, um, well, one, it'll also help determine 
well, what are you going to do to help prevent it? <laughs> but then if something does happen, you can you at least have an idea of what the costs might be for it. The risk response should be implemented in ways to address gaps between message communicated by organization and stakeholders' expectations. And what that basically is saying is that, you know, if the expectations were here, how, how are we going to reassure the public and meet those, fill those gaps based upon a response that we're going to be able to go back up there? Uh, and then finally, monitor and report. Risk should be continually monitored um, for early detection so that immediate corrective action can be taken uh, and allow, again, report appropriately to allow timely response. Last couple of things, roles and responsibilities must be clearly defined, especially at the senior leadership and board level. People need to, you know, somewhat crisis management. People know, should know what their roles are. And barriers to managing reputation risk are rooted in lack of clarity, resources, and awareness. And that's probably the biggest issue is that people don't know what the reputation issues they're dealing with. And so if there's no clarity uh, of, of what the reputational risks are, there's no resources of what to do with it, or even awareness of how to deal with it, then you run into some of those issues. I think we went through the whole thing. So, and I thought we we're going to end early tonight, and we didn't. So, um, well, thanks everyone. Uh, we look forward to, uh, next week. Uh, we're what, chapter six. Uh, we'll be discussing that, and I think we'll talk about legal and regulatory risks or something around there uh, on that one. So, we'll see everyone next week. Thanks. What role did the